Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Chicanics, Dreamers and Changemakers, live from the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. My name is Sasha Schertzer, Teen Librarian at BPL, and on behalf of both the Library and the Museum of Anthropology, we are so pleased you could all join us today. This program is taking place on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Unceded means that this land was never sold or given away. If you are joining us from elsewhere, please feel free to let us know in the chat. And if you know to whom the land traditionally belongs, please include that information as well. Chicanics, Dreamers and Changemakers is an exhibition showcasing artists of Mexican-American heritage who self-identify as Chicanics, a term that transcends borders and gender to encompass the Chicanics people's multi-generational experiences of social differences. There is a digital supplement to this exhibition, Chicanics Digital, available that amplifies the scope of the exhibition. The link will be shared during the presentation and again at the end for you to explore at your leisure. The presentation will take approximately 45 minutes. You will have the opportunity to ask questions during the presentation. We will also be holding time for questions at the end. Please use the question and answer function on Zoom to ask any questions related to the presentation. My colleague, Jean, will be on hand to assist with any technical questions that arise from the audience. Because this is a webinar, we have limited capacity to troubleshoot, but we'll do our best to help. Please put any technical questions in the chat. During the presentation, we welcome audience comments in the chat. We are sure that many will be moved by the artwork featured in the tour. Please be kind and courteous in your words. The program is being recorded and will be made available online after the presentation. We are very excited to introduce you to our presenters for the morning and grateful to them for sharing their time, passion, and expertise with us. Greta De Leon and Jill Baird are the co-curators of Chicanics. Greta De Leon is the executive director of the Americas Research Network with a long career promoting, curating, and amplifying Latin American art and culture. Dr. Jill Baird is a curator of education at the Museum of Anthropology. She works alongside artists, cultural practitioners, and cultural educators from diverse and distinct communities. Thank you so much for being here today, Greta and Jill. The floor is yours. Please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. It's, it's great to be here on the cyber webs and, and, and to accompany you and to see Chicken X also online. It's, it's pretty great. Hola, Jill. Hello, everyone. Can you see? I too am uh, here uh, in, in person in the exhibition. It's nice to join you all electronically and to see Greta from Mexico City. Um, isn't it amazing what technology can do with, we can do nowadays. So I'm going to start off our tour. So I'm Jill Baird, and uh, I've had an amazing opportunity of co-curating this exhibition called Chicken X, Dreamers and Changemakers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, um, it took about three years for this exhibition to get started. And uh, working during a pandemic uh, has a certain sort of flavor to uh, our work. So this tech digital world is becoming more comfortable to us. But I'm going to start here by introducing myself. Uh, I'm the curator of education, as was already mentioned. Um, I'm a settler of Irish, uh, French, and uh, Scottish background, and I'm working on the unceded territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people here at UBC. And I'm standing in front of our first artwork, which always brings joy to my heart when I come down the hallway here and see this work by Alejandro Diaz saying, Make tacos, not war. Seems simple, doesn't it? A statement that maybe if we all joined each other at the dinner table or went out and had a meal together, how we could uh, heal the harms of the world. Um, the artist is Alejandro Diaz and he's out of New York City currently. And I just think it's a really important beginning to this show. Um, why it's an important beginning? Because it's a, just a statement. It's a statement that would be really hard to disagree with. <laughs> Um, but also it reflects the artist's own passions and interests of using signage, sometimes very common signage, but delivering it in a new way, making you maybe think a bit deeper or provoking it. 
An interesting piece of history for this piece is that Alejandro Diaz, when he moved after art school to New York City, he found it a bit hard to find work and to get paid as an artist. So he started making signs out of cardboard and Sharpies. A famous one he's uh, well known for was holding a sign that says Audrey Hepburn stood here and he's holding the sign outside of the very famous jewelry store, Tiffany's in New York City. And anyways, someone bought his sign. They bought the photograph of him holding his sign. And it's not the only kind of artwork uh, Alejandro does, but he's kept on with this sort of simple signage that actually, when you think about it for a minute, maybe is not that simple. It's a good introduction into the exhibition. We're gonna move in and I'm gonna pass it over to Greta. Hi, I'm, I'm Greta de Leon and I am connecting from Mexico right now. Uh, it has been um, a lot of joy, fun and intensity to, 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 to do this show with Jill and um, to, to showcase the art of this amazing artist. There are also activists. So one of the important things about Chicano and Chicanex, yeah? Someone said something? Sorry. Ah. No, I think um, you did. Yeah? Go ahead. Okay. About Chicano and Chicanex is um, that it's a chosen identity. They, they self-proclaim as Chicano. It's an artistic movement and it's a social and an activist movement for, for access to equal rights by this um, group of, of Mexican Americans. So in order for themselves to be called Chicano, Chicano or Chicanex, it's kind of like an active role. And one of the active roles that they have used is how they, they have reclaimed their space and their neighborhoods through art. So this wall here that you will see, it's a projection of all these different street art and murals throughout the United States by Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex artists. And they, they varied, we wanted to showcase, it was kind of hard and interesting to, to, to be able to show uh, murals inside of a gallery. So they came up with the amazing idea of screening them, projecting them on the walls, and you will see the, the diversity. You can, you can go online to the, to, the, to the website and you can see these, these murals with their, with their locations. So they are all throughout the state. So we have in Texas and California and New York, in New Mexico, in Detroit, in Chicago. So they are all over and wanted to show to show you that that the Chicano artistic movements and the Chicanos are everywhere in, in the state. So this was a, um, a way that we, we use that. And one of the things that we wanted to, to also tell you about the exhibit is Chicanex. Um, we, we spell it with an X at the beginning to, to pay not, not homage, but to recognize the indigenous roots in, 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 in their original territory um, in the Nahuatl speaking countries. So the, the sound of CH that is represented by the Spaniards, the Nahuatl is spelled with an X. And the X at the end is to signify uh, inclusivity. So that's why the name is spelled as of the exhibit is spelled like that. You want to add something, Jill, about the murals? No, I think that, thank you. I just think it um, would be an amazing trip, actually. Take a road trip and uh, <laughs> drive around the United States just looking for Chicano, Chicanx murals. We're going to move to the next work, and it's by an artist named Esther Hernandez. There's over 33 artists in the show. So this morning, we're just giving you a real snapshot of the exhibition. So this is called Libertad by Esther Hernandez. What are your thoughts, Greta? Yeah, Mi Libertad, this is, this is a really, really important print. Esther Hernandez is a very established and kind of like the old school and one of the beginners of the, of the movimiento. It's one of the iconic leaders, um, artistic leaders and, and a fantastic artist and the way she she worked this piece is you have the statue of liberty right that is like 
everybody knows it. But then you have this woman that is carving away her identity in this, in this structure. So underneath the Statue of Liberty, where she is carving away, is a Mayan Stella. So I think this piece really hits on the essence of the of, of the movement and on, on the exhibit, you see Aztlan. Aztlan is the name of the of their ancestral homeland um, for the for the Chicanos. Chicanos is it's a really interesting composition and cultural composition and genetic composition. You have they are Mexican American descent, but at the same time they are U.S. citizens, right? So it's not like anybody can claim to be a Chicano. They have a very specific sets of concerns and of um, issues that they wanted to address. And the connection to the indigeneity, it's very important for them, these linkages and to embrace these linkages and to embrace this origin. So I think this, this piece is very, is very appropriate to, to, to show you what we wanted to say in the exhibit and, and, and to summarize a lot of, of the work of the, of the artist. Thank you, Greta. Greta mentioned something called El Movimiento, and I encourage you all to do a little bit more research, but a, a way of saying it in English is the Chica Chicano Civil Rights Movement. We may be familiar with the Black history of the United States, slavery, and the Civil Rights Movement. I think many of us, particularly in Canada, have a lot to learn about the Chicano Civil Rights Movement. And like the artists in this exhibition, including Esther, the role of artists, in these kind of social justice movements. We're gonna move on to another work. Follow me into the gallery. So when we follow Jia, I'll just mention very briefly that the whole exhibit is bilingual. It was very important for us that the words um, of the artists are um, showcased and respected the way that they have chosen to, to use their language. So all the text, all the poetry that is accompanying the exhibit, all the labels, everything is in English and Spanish, but the spelling in English and Spanish is according to, to the artist. I'm gonna start um, at this piece by uh, San Antonio artist, Deborah Kutzpal Vasquez, but I'm gonna start with a piece of poetry. Uh, all throughout the exhibition, there's poetry by Chicano, Chicana um, uh, writers and thinkers and theorists and poets um, that accompanies the artwork as a way to actually spur our thinking and maybe uh, get us to jump into some creative pools that are new to us. So I'm gonna start with the one beside uh, this work by Sandro Cisnero. I've put up with too much, too long, and now I'm just too intelligent, too powerful, too beautiful too sure of who I am finally to deserve anything less. And so we're standing here, or I'm standing here in front of this work by Deborah uh, called Sitlali. And she's fierce, don't you think? She's a superhero or an anti-hero. Uh, Deborah Kutsapal Vasquez is a very strong Chicana feminist and a queer activist. And she really wants the woman's body to be seen as a powerful, uh, take, no, <laughs> uh, take no guff, if, you can, if I may say so. On Sitlali, we have on her chest a very common uh, figure, um, the Virgin of Guadalupe. But this Virgin of Guadalupe, she's on fire because of the passion and strength that this woman holds, but also because of the history that what this woman represents. If we look around the, uh, the, the surroundings that Sitlali's in, we have the moon and the stars through the windows in the kitchen. We have the foods, traditional foods being, she's being surrounded by from frijole, maize, maguey, chile, calabazo, nopal, and amaranto. These are all really important foods, but what uh, Deborah is trying to um, make relationships to is the matriarchy the women in her lives, her grandmothers and great grandmothers and aunts who are part of the, her teachings. And I guess to remind us all that your teachings don't only come from books, your teachings can come from the kitchen table around the people who love you and are trying to teach you. And uh, so she does that by painting this superhero um, 
in, in the kitchen. And you can look up uh, Deborah Vasquez on the uh, digital catalog, and you can see she's done quite a few sit lallies. And for those of you who are like the zine world, she's also a pretty amazing zine maker. She sees the value in these cheap, quick uh, printed images or booklets that speak to a, an issue. So she's used zine making as part of her artistic practice for many, many years now. When I'm gonna make a comment also on the food. So, so the Chicano artistic movement and the Chicano movement is really wide. I mean, has many manifestations and one of this literature, some of it is filmmaking, music uh, and cuisine. So in our digital catalog on Chicanex Digital, uh, the, the website there, you can find recipes from the artists that they, they like to, to eat. So if you wanna try to cook some chicken eggs food, you can also find interesting recipes in the, in the website. I'm on our way to the next uh, location. I'm just gonna ask Amina who I didn't introduce. So Amina Chergi is uh, the education um, coordinator here at the Museum of Anthropology and our talented uh, camera woman today. She's just gonna take a spin around so you can sort of see the context of all of this work. And then we're gonna to move to a very powerful work. Actually, I think all the work in the show is really powerful. It's actually a hard thing to do to ask a curator to choose eight or seven pieces in an exhibition when there's over 40 and that you love every one of them. So Amina's giving you just a little bit of context for the show. And we could do an entire another conversation about the art of actually making a show. What is curation? What, what, what kind of design is required? How many arguments do you have over wall colors? <laughs> but that's a different tour. We're going to move to this work here. We're going to start with a map that, and a quote that's very common in the Chicanx world, which is, we did not cross the border. The border crossed us. And then we're going to move to the work by Carlos Frescas called Salon de los Igales. Ilegales, yeah. This, this map will really put into perspective what happened in 1848 after the US and Mexico war. Um, Mexico lost half of its territory to the United States. So the United States used to be that. And, and Mexico used to go all the way to Texas, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Florida was French. I mean, Louisiana, sorry, was French. And, and you could see, so, so when we talked about the Chicanos and Chicanas, they have this, this sense that they, they were there before. They, they were forced into speak English. So when they talked about being colonized once and twice, they were colonized three times, right? One by the Spaniards, by the Mexican government, and then by the US. And their language was forbidden. So they were not able to speak Spanish in their schools anymore. They suddenly, from one day to the next, they became US citizens and their language was English. So a lot of, of, of the Spanish that the Chicano and Chicana and Mexican Americans use is Spanglish and is this amazing creation of, of mixing and navigating between the two languages and the two cultures. So we wanted to show you this first to, to, to give you a sense of the space and, and, and how their lives changed. So when they say they, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, nosotros no cruzamos la frontera, la frontera nos atravesó, that's what it means, right? And the next piece is by Carlos Fresques. And Carlos Fresques is, um, is a really interesting artist. He's going to be soon in, in um, I think, or, or, or was last week, it, uh, speaking with, with Jill and, and, and the museum. And he created these landscapes that he found in all in like thrift shops. And they're like these iconic landscapes of the, trees or the mountains or beach scenes. And he used like a stencil to print out this image of this family running, right? So when you see the, the street signs um, in the highway saying like careful bears or deer crossing or students crossing or something, 
In California, they used to have a street sign that will warn you um, for immigrants, immigrants crossing. The last, the last um, the street sign was disappeared in 2018. Um, fortunately, nobody wanted to, to put them back because it's not like a street sign that makes you want to be concerned about the well-being about of these families crossing. Uh, illegally the border right they 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 warn you to not to damage your car and to like hit on them so it's a little bit uh, strong the 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 image and carlos what he did is i'm trying to give validity or give them um legality by placing this image in throughout different landscapes of of, of the united states and by doing that i'm making legal, the illegal, or permanent, the impermanent. And I, I think intellectually is a really interesting way or, or action. And at the same time, emotionally just moves um, and touches a lot of, of, of points. So you can see the enormous diversity of, of the land. And at the same time, you have this, this, this family that was running through a better life and in a land that it was used to be theirs. So there's a whole, a, a lot of food for thought. So this work is Salón de los Ilegales by Carlos, Carlos Fresques. Yeah, I just add something to that, Greta, that Carlos has shown this work in various ways. And for this installation, we wanted to put the images of the different kinds of landscapes all across the United States. So that we also move away from the idea that uh, Chicanx or Chicano, Chicanx uh, people are only close to borders. Um, currently, uh, more than 130 million people in the United States have Spanish as a first language. So we're not talking about a small, those aren't all people who are Chicano or Chicanx, but it just goes to say, maybe to for us to learn more about the actual histories and where people live and make families and contribute to communities across the, the United States. We're gonna move on to an, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Greta, would you like to add something? Yeah, I was just gonna very briefly mention when Amina gave the little show of, of the exhibit is we organized the exhibit a little bit thematically. You will see that more in the digital catalog. So this area, we call it the borderlands. We don't talk about the border region. I mean, we don't talk about the border line as a line because it is a region. And it's a region that shares environments, that shares family, that shares languages, that shares, a lot. So this this part where we are right now, looking at the work is is the borderlands. That that was that was all I was saying. That's thank you. And I'll just also do another uh, recitation of one of the poets in the that is in the wall that helps us think as well through these artworks and these issues. This is a quote by Gloria Ilanzaldua. I walk through a hole in the fence to the other side. Under my fingers, I feel the gritty wire rusted by 139 years of the salty breath of the sea. I think for me, though, these poetic elements just add depth and uh, sort of strength to already powerful artworks. We're gonna move over now to a, a print. I don't know if anybody on the, uh, on the Zoom call is an artist or who works in your schools on printmaking. But printmaking was a really important, continues to be a really important artistic choice by many Chicanx artists. Um, even from the 1970s during El Movimiento, prints you could, able make, you could make duplicates or you could make many and spread them far. You could use them as posters in order to support your protests. So printmaking is a really important part of the Chicano civil rights movement and the, Ch the Chicanx arts movement. Here's a piece by Celeste Luna. And uh, it's both heartbreaking and powerful. It's called Our Lady of the Checkpoint. Like on the chest of Sitlali, we have another image of the Virgin of Guadalupe. But this time, instead of the aura of fire and beauty around this aura, we have 
um, barbed wire. So this is a woman who's trying to cross the border. And Celeste is very eloquent and um, strong in her concerns and pointing us to her concerns about the role of women and how women in these situations of border crossings are often harmed to a much greater extent than others. Um, here we have a small um, camera. You can see as you would be, uh, 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 your image taken as you cross the border. But here we don't have a person, we have a skeleton. So they don't see the humanity. They move past the individual to the person, to this um, skeletal form. You can see the American flag and the Mexican flag. I don't know, is this a border that you would want to cross? Imagine what kind of power and hope and determination you would have to have if you're not greeted by a welcome. Instead, you're greeted by violence or hatred or homophobia or racism. It's quite a large print too. Again, for any of you who are printmakers, pulling prints that are this large, that's actually quite a technical skill. Anything you'd like to add, Greta, before I move on? No, I, well, maybe if, if Amina can just show our third conceptual Virgen of Guadalupe, no, the work by Ricky Armendariz. Mm -hmm. Yes, we could stop here. That's a great idea. This, this is also kind of like another image of, of, of the Virgen de Guadalupe. So you see the halo around this jug of water and you see the landscape of the border. And this is, this is kind of what for, an, for, a, for someone who is crossing the border in the desert, people will leave these plastic jugs of water filled with water along the way to, to, to help them and, 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 and help them survive this, this really difficult um, way. So, so when, when this artist puts the halo of the Virgen de Guadalupe around a, a jug of water, we, we think it was very also moving and, 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 and strong. And I'll just add another point to that. It's also, um, it's called Agua Mi Vida. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are now groups of people who actually mark safe passage across the, uh, across the borders using these water jugs so that they know people are coming and they wanna make sure that at the minimum they have enough to survive this fairly treacherous journey. You can see the landscape in the, in the back, which is actually quite, a, and on some border crossings, quite desert-like. So the need for water is even more extreme. And for the artists in the crowd, it's also half painting, half carving. The image is actually etched into this wooden board. So it's a beautiful um, acrylic painting but the artist has etched it. I don't know if you can get the angle there where you can see it's actually carved into the surface of the paint. How are we doing for time, Sasha? You might have to give us a... <laughs> uh, very good, very good. Got about I think 20 once minutes. You get, when you, once you get Greta and I talking, we could go forever. So the next work we're in front of is an entire wall of portraits, black and white, beautifully rendered, just beautiful faces. The work is called Justice for Our Lives. And it's by an artist named Ori Arijanal. It's a name that he's chosen for this particular work. His name, if you wanna search some of his other artwork and you can see that on the Chicanex Digital, is Daniel Jimenez. This is uh, quite a powerful and very often disturbing work for many people. So I'm just gonna give you a bit of a warning. It, this, this work can be highly emotional for the viewer. And of course it was very emotional for the artists. It's 100 portraits of black and brown people, black people in Chicana, Chicanx, who have been killed by the police since the year 2000. So it speaks directly to police violence, um, racial profiling, racism and homophobia. But what Ori has done 
is opened up this beautiful window into these people. So it's called Justice for Our Lives. He's gotten consent. He has a very ethical practice. He's gotten consent from all of the families. That's where he gets the photographs that he works with to do his portraits. Um, he gets the details of the situation. And sometimes that's the only place these details are publicly accessible. How did it happen? Where did it happen? Who was involved? Families have often relied on his documentation um, in order to get a bit more information about the loss of their loved ones. It also moves away from statistics, how many people are killed by the police and puts a full name and a beautiful image. So they, one, are not forgotten, but also they are people, they have families, they were loved. We have a, a summer uh, Indigenous uh, uh, youth program here at the museum. And this summer they trained to give, become tour guides. These young Indigenous high school students became tour guides of this exhibition. And one of them who was uh, uh, Afro-Indigenous really took to this work. First, she was pained by seeing it, uh, tears and uh, worry. And then she started looking and she said, I wonder if the artist made it black and white so that first you see their humanity. Hmm. That's nice. And I yeah. thought, you know, for all of us, we all have so much to learn, but also we need to see each other's humanity first and then continue that in our bodies, in our minds, in our souls. They're powerful portraits. One other, uh, just a side note about you know, the curatorial process and working to put up an exhibition. Um, both Greta and I were completely struck by this work and it needed to have a very large presence in the gallery. These, this, the, these, these histories need to be better known. In the installation, these are, um, it's, these are free. You can go onto his website. He charges no money. You can download them and spread them around. He would be very happy to see them on um, telephone poles and street signs, street sides. So when we put it up, um, we used uh, wheat paste like you were if you were doing postering around town. But we invited the people who put it up to uh, remember the name of one of the uh, people that they put on the wall. That included myself, my staff, my grandkids, and a group of Latino artists who came in and um, helped uh, paint these onto the wall. It seemed like a nice gesture to also keep that remembrance in place. Greta, was there anything you would like to add? No. All you, right. You did that beautifully. Maybe just, just a minute to reflect on all these people, boys, girls, men, women. You could also uh, give a scan uh, of this space, that this exhibition, this part of the exhibition. We call this the sort of activist area, which in all truth, every artist in this show is an activist. But we just thought that some of the work speaks more directly to making sure the history of these communities is documented. And the way artists choose to do that is never straightforward. It's always a nuanced, and in this case, very often very political. We're going to go to another work, and this time we're going to let the artist speak for a little while, and then, um, and then Greta can fill you in. We've come in with the video going halfway, so I'm just going to put the mic to the... This is a work by David Zamora Casas, and it's called The Altar for the Spirit of Huasquachismo, dedicated to the memory of David. Tomás Ibarra, Frausto y Dudley Moore. 
Beaner is a slur, insulting ancient rich culinary history of Mexican cuisine by calling people like me who eat beans, Beaner. Montezuma comía frijoles. <clears throat> With purity of emotion and depth of the highest vibration, this altar installation honors the author of the essay, Rasquachismo, a Chicano sensibility, and is dedicated to the late Mr. Dudley Brooks, paying tribute to the both living genius and the dearly departed. Since the day they met, July 22nd, 1968, Don Tomasi Barafrausto and Dudley Brooks have shared a spiritual union. 53 years. On a March morning in 2022, Dudley Brooks transitioned into the infinite power of the universe. Mr. Brooks fell into a deep, deep sleep, shutting his eyes never to open them again. Eyes closed, spirit separated from body, body separated from shadow. I pictured Dudley in his guayabera and elegant rimmed hat in all his radiance and glory. I hear him advise me, David, never take advantage when you have the advantage. Life is not about the money. Life is about self-love, love of language, love of culture, love of literature. To love is to do for another. I hear the voice of Tomas say, tu eres mi otro yo. Mi media naranja y medio limón. Dudley Brooks. So this this was a very and, and strong experience um, for us. Um, we we Mexicans and, and Chicanos we put altars in our homes for Day of the Dead to share uh, a moment with our departed and the people who has passed. And on during Day of the Dead, we put out food, we put out candles and, and we commune with them. A lot of the times we'll go to the graveyards and have music and bring some tequila or beer or agua fresca or candy or whatever your departed person enjoyed. And, and you will spend time with them and you will listen to their music and you will honor them and you bring them into your, your everyday life again. You no, know? they're always present and they are they're with you, they're part of, of, of you. So when when David came to Mexico to, to record this video piece, um, this this altar was going to be a tribute to, to Tomás Ibarra Frausto, who is this amazing Chicano scholar who came up with the term of rascuachismo, this concept. Of, of, of aesthetic of, of Chicano, where more is more. And, and it, one thing that Chicanos do as well is um, they take a derogatory term and they change it and they appropriate it and they own it. And then it does not uh, turn into an insult anymore, it's, it's their own word. So someone will call it a rascuache, it's cha chafa. No? So they will tell like, no, no, rascuachismo is a whole aesthetic. Uh, posture and, 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 and way of, of, of being. So when we were in, in Mexico about to start the recording of this series of poems that David wrote, and then there's also a really funny glossary at the end, um, Tomas, Tomas' partner Dudley died that day, the day before we were gonna record the video. And David was incredibly affected because he was very, very close to both of them. And that changed the whole direction of the of the altar and it was now dedicated to this this gay couple that were together for 50 something years that in in the chicano tradition is was not very easy um to come out of the closet it was kind of a very macho oriented kind of movement and posture and 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 they 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 kind of broke the ceiling and, and they were this incredibly supportive, amazing, loving couple. And, um, and David was working um, in the video while, while this happened. So this, this 
this altar. It celebrates life and it celebrates the, the death. And it is this mix of, of, of emotions. And, and, and David said it really, really beautiful in all his poetry. So you will find uh, like the Quatwi, Quatli, uh, yeah, the band, the, um, the Mexica, yeah. goddess, and, gods. and the photographs of all these different. Um, but yeah, this, this was this was. Um, it was super fun to create with the artist too. If I can add, Greta, yeah. he was here in Vancouver for a week, and we learned how to make. We brought some of the flowers. We made some flowers. He kept adding things. There was an aesthetic that he was going to, um, in order you could see life and love, and vibrancy was really fun to work with an artist. We're gonna wrap up with one last, because Greta mentioned um, the Virgin of Guadalupe. So on the other wall across the hallway from uh, David Zamora Casas' altar are two exquisite small photographs, both that have show the, by Al Rendon, um, both that show the uh, Virgin of Guadalupe. One tattooed on the chest of a poet named Raul Salinas. And the other on a bedspread, his auntie, Tia Maria, on her bedspread. Just to show you the role of photography as well. So you've gotten a, a, a quick insight into what uh, Chicken X Dreamers and Changemakers um, exhibition is. It's up until January 15th here at uh, the museum. And um, January 15th? Oh, first. Uh, I think we're going to extend it to the 15th. Oh, wow. Yes, exciting. But there's many other artists in the show. We encourage you to come down and see it in person. We also encourage you to have a look at the Chicken X Digital. You can, as Greta said, you can get some uh, good recipes, but also there's a pretty good playlist on Spotify as part of that and a great reading list because we asked some of the artists, what are they reading? What, what motivates them? So Sasha, is uh, there is some time for questions? Yes, thank you. Um, so there is, uh, you mentioned about, um, that you could talk more about just the process of curating the whole mm -hmm. piece of it and whatnot. And I understand from talking with Greta earlier too, that um, obviously it was a little bit different maybe than <laughs> um, was expected because you all began working together in March, 2020. So if you want to um, maybe start out a little bit, the two of you talking about that, and then I'll um, field questions as they come in on the question and answer function. <laughs> Yes, well, it is a, there's probably a story to write here, Greta, eh? yeah. um, that uh, uh, when we started, uh, we did our first artist visits actually in February of 2020, just in advance of the pandemic. And that was the only second time I'd ever met uh, Greta de Leon. I flew to San Antonio and she flew to San Antonio and we met there and we went and visited I don't know, maybe 20 different artists and studios. I have, um, I have, I have I'm gonna have to say something there, Jill, because uh, I think it was a premonition. A premonition? Yeah, because do you remember you lost your flight? Uh-huh. So we ended up starting to do studio visits with artists on what that time was a, a Skype. I think it was a Skype, yes. it was not Zoom. Yeah. So, I was walking around with a computer. Jill was sitting in an airport. I was in the studio of the artist showing to Jill the works. And we were both talking like for the first time about like the really the needy and greedy of the works. And, and she was, it, it was kind of like pre, pre, premonitions of what was about to come. So we were prepared for the pandemic and Zoom. Oh. I had forgotten that. I my flight got delayed, so my connections didn't work. And I was in a corner in the Seattle airport on my laptop, sitting there in a corner trying to find quiet space while you showed while you met uh, Tomosi Fresco. 
and you. Dudley. And I met and them via, via, that's right, Al Rendon, the photos we just saw. I saw his studio virtually. So we did get to see a few of the artists in, in, in real life, which is amazing. And, you know, in the best of all words, the best way to do it, because then you get to have a cup of tea or coffee and visit um, and see a breadth of their work. But after um, the pandemic hit, I was actually visiting artists in Los Angeles for this show. And the world shut down, as we all know, on March 13th. So I flew home. And after that, we continued to meet some artists, but it was via Zoom. And they walked us around their, um, their studios or they showed us uh, images of their work. And then Greta and I worked on which works we wanted in the show. You go back and forth and you say this one, that one, not that one. And then sometimes some of the work you want, you can't have because uh, there's a whole challenge in bringing artwork. It has to be available. Um, we worked at choosing colors. I vividly remember um, a meeting where Greta was, I think in Mexico at the time, on Zoom for sure. Um, and we were using colors for the walls. And we had to make sure that the color that she saw on the screen was as accurate as possible to the real color because sometimes color morphs on, in technology. Um, it was an amazing process. We worked with exhibition designer Skuka Broom and graphic, a graphic designer Cody Rocco. And it's such a back and forth process. This is not, uh, the artist says this and the curator says that. It's a much more collaborative, many, many conversations. And, um, and I it's think that- Wonderful because one at the time would you also like digest a lot of your thinking process and kind of like points and zoom on what you actually want to say in the exhibition by all of these talks and discussions from one of the things that Jill and I we, we were very lucky because we we kind of struck gold in the collaboration we we both like a lot of the same things and were concerned about the same issues and wanted to showcase we didn't want to we, we didn't want to explain to you what Chicano is, art is supposed to be we want them to explain and to we just gave them the room and uh and that's that's why also a lot of the poetry is in the walls and a lot of the fragments of of the conversations of thoughts the same because we wanted we wanted to amplify those voices and and so so when you're working with someone and you're co-curating show you you're both coming from very very different perspectives and different different histories and backgrounds but for us, we, we were lucky and, and, and we had the same intentions and, and ideas. So that that was, I was very joyful also to, to work with, with the Skooker and Cody in, in the whole notion of the of the of the exhibit. So and with everybody, it's just been it's been a, a really it's a really beautiful show. And I hope you guys can go see it in person as well. Yeah, I remember one thing. I think we're probably getting close to the end here, but I remember one time. I think for the walls where the quotes are and the, the poetic excerpts, um, I think at one point uh, Greta and I had 40, uh, a list of 40 quotes we thought we would use. We, we, you, you have to, you go deep and you go broad and you learn a whole bunch of stuff and then your job is to whittle it down, make it uh, understandable and don't overwhelm people and let the art speak for itself instead of um, a lot of text telling you how to think and wh what to think. So it was really important. The end, the end movement was we really agreed 100% that our job as curators in this exhibition was to hold the microphone to the artists and for their work and their words to speak. Yeah. That actually segues very nicely into the next question, which is how did you choose the poetry uh, that ended up on the walls. So you mentioned you started out with a lot. How did, we get, how did we get to the final final round? <laughs> well, I think we started with a lot before we had actually started to organize the show. So we had organized the works so we know which artworks were coming. We hadn't started to organize the artworks because they have to be grouped and to make some access. Artworks needs to speak to each other in the room. 
So they can't, it, this is not a solo show. So they're different artists, different traditions. So we needed to make sure the artwork spoke to each other. So once we started doing these themes of neighborhoods, homes, identity, activism, and borderlands, then that helped us started to whittle down some of the quotes to make sure that the quotes spoke directly to those ideas and the more direct and powerful um, because so many people, particularly in Vancouver, the show would work in a different way if it was in an American city or in a Mexican city. So we had to remember that we also had to let people know that they might not know some of these poets. They might not know many of these artists. So our job was not to teach them a history, but to open a door. Would you share that idea, Greta? I, I, indeed, I will share that idea. And, and also to have a diversity of, of the works that we will have the same number of women writers as male writers. We, we, we constantly had that, that concern that we, will, that we will give them the, the same room and, and um, mm -hmm. okay, so, so that, that was important for us as well. And, and we selected the works also having really old fragments of kind of like the essential poems or texts by the Chicano movement, as well as really, really new ones. Uh, poems like the one behind Jill or, or, or others. I mean, there's, there's, there's that, we wanted to, to, to showcase that, that variety. You can also read all the text on chickenxr.com. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And um, let's go for one last one, which is always, I think, a nice one. Um, what are your favorite works in the oh. exhibition? <laughs> <laughs> That's all so hard. <laughs> all of them. Depends okay, on the for me, depends on the day. For me, it depends. depends on the day. Okay, that's I like that. Today, my favorite work is <laughs> exactly. today. My favorite work is Esther Hernandez's. Ah, so, Libertad, Libertad. So today, my favorite work is Sitlali, and that's mostly because well, I think it's good any day. But uh, we had the pleasure of having uh, Deborah Kutzfel Vasquez in Vancouver last week in person to give some artist talks. So her energy is still in the room for me. So mm -hmm. this would be my favorite work today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a disclaimer, Jill, because that, that's your favorite work a lot of the days. <laughs> a lot. How can you go wrong with such a powerful woman? <laughs> that's, it's you, that's your alter ego. I totally <laughs> That's right. When I leave here and I take my black jacket off, <laughs> I could be Sid Lale. <laughs> that's wonderful. That was a very graceful way of answering. It depends on the day, but I think that's very true for a lot of art, right? Because like the whole point is it sort of speaks to you at different stages in your life. And that could just be also just different parts of your day too. Um, thank you so much um, to Greta and Jill for sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. Uh, that was incredible. <laughs> Um, the exhibition looks amazing and I know we only saw the tiniest part of it um, but it is going on until it sounds like uh, January 15th not just January 1st uh, which is very exciting so I do hope that our attendees will have a chance to visit the museum um, and see uh, the art in person um, it looks like it'd be so amazing to walk through that space for sure um, can I just make a, a pitch about coming to the museum? Yes, please do. Uh, uh, indigenous people are always free at MOA. And Thursday nights, we have a flat rate of $10. Wonderful. Thank you. That's important, good information to know, for sure. And um, also, and then, oh, sorry. The also check a lot of the programming on the, on the website, because they will have um, other artist talks, I'm going to be there in a couple of weeks with some of the other artists and and there's all they're always doing tours and visits so it's it's pretty it's pretty great and workshops so and we're, we're celebrating day of the dead this year at MOA so on November 1st which is an important celebration in the Mexican Mexican American calendar we're going to be open late that Tuesday and there'll be so much fun Mariachi, an Aztec group, there'll be uh, Pane Morte, which is a little cake, hot chocolate, tours. So you can come out that night and have some fun.
That sounds absolutely amazing. Um, for the attendees, I did put the um, uh, Chicanix exhibit um, website off of the Museum of Anthropology in the chat. Um, so you can click on that and see some of these great um, events that are still coming up. And then also related, here is the link for Chicanix Digital, which is the online platform. Um, that has been made to accompany the exhibit. There is so much information on it. Um, our curators already mentioned that there's like recipes and playlists and um, you know reading recommendations along with the art and then also a lot of information just about how everything was put together and it just it's it's so great um, especially if you are gonna sort of uh, extend on this with your classes um, later on which would be amazing. Um, I did mention at the beginning that it is being recorded. Um, so once it is uploaded to the website, um, I will be sending out a link to the video to everyone who is registered. So you can also use that um, as an extension later on, um, maybe accompanying uh, your visit to Chicanix Digital and then maybe a visit in person to the exhibit. Um, and also Greta and Jill have generously offered to answer any further questions from the audience. So if in your conversations with your classes or colleagues later on, you have um, some questions that you would love to know the answer to, um, please send your questions to teens at vpl.ca um, and we will um, collate them and forward them to uh, Greta and Jill um, to continue the conversation. Um, thank you all so much for being here this morning. It was lovely to spend the morning with you and with Greta and Jill and with the art. I had a wonderful time. I know everyone else did as well. Um, have a wonderful day, everybody. We'll see you around. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day.